slow again. So this is uh, question and answer session number three. I figured we should start labelling them because um, uh, there's going to be quite a few. We've still got eight months to go of the race. So if we do this every week, uh, it mounts up and I'll probably look the same. But I might do it from a decent position later on. The bad news, had a bit of a disaster today, not with the race. I lost my glasses. So these aren't mine. I've borrowed them because <laughs> I need to read. Um, so uh, anyway, we'll get straight into it. Um, we had uh, interesting uh, reaction to the session so far. Thanks for all the comments. Uh, appreciate that. That's kind of good. Um, and uh, we're always interested in feedback. If you've got ideas or something that's going on and obviously we have questions once a week so uh, um, keep them coming that's kind of fun so uh, we've got one here um, regarding uh, one of the one of uh, the guys uh, actually saw my uh, BOC video I've got a, a documentary that I did in 1990 uh, it's called McIntyre Knockdown it's on the McIntyre Adventure GGR channel you can you can search for it on YouTube just called McIntyre Knockdown and it was interesting because when I did it, I, um, I filmed it for sailors. Um, back then, technology wasn't like it is now. It was filmed on a, um, a Video 8 camera, which was analog. It wasn't even digital. Um, but I put microphones around the boat so I could speak to it. And it's, uh, for some, it's too long and boring. It goes for an hour and 45 minutes, <laughs> right? Um, but, it, but it was a best-selling marine video in America for about four or five months, sold a lot in Australia. And back in those days, uh, we found out that the Whitbread race uh, back then um, was actually decided to use that as an educational tool for um, their, their first idea of having a cameraman on, on their boat. So you may find it interesting, but certainly there's a sequence there. I, I, I talk, talk to the camera a bit about how I'm feeling. And if you wanna know how the GGR entrants are going in the race, you might find it very relevant because I was going through the same things, going through the doldrums and, and uh, down to Cape Town. We stopped, there were four legs in this, this uh, uh, BOC challenge and then from Cape Town went to Sydney so that was my first experience of the true Southern Ocean and I explain a lot of that and you see what happens um, and then after Sydney we go through to uh, Portaleste in Uruguay around Cape Horn and again the same thing and you'll see my reaction to a 360 degree rollover when when it happened to me and he was asking he said hey um, wh what's the deal with the 360s you know uh, did you talk about this with uh, entrance and what preparations might have they done because for me I actually took a, a kayaking helmet with me because uh, I knew some people had been injured in knockdowns and rollovers. So I would wear that um, when I thought that a knockdown was possible, uh, although they'd always sneak up on you. <laughs> I don't know whether I got to wear it on any of the knockdowns, but um, I wore it at ca occasions when I thought we were at risk. And um, uh, because the problem is when you go down and around, you're getting bounced around the cabin. Um, so. The one thing I did talk about often with entrants, and I don't think any of them did it, <laughs> they made it, was we did research. I, I was involved with another Around the World race that didn't happen. It was called uh, Together Alone Around the World. We tried to get that up in Australia back in the year 2000, and it was with paying crew as well as shorthanded crew. Long story, but we did some research on what was going on with the British Steel Challenge. That was the paying crew going around the world. And the incidents that they had with people getting injured was always getting thrown out of their bunk. So when we sent one of our boats around with 12 people on it around the world on an expedition, we actually put straps on the bunks and it paid dividends. And all, a lot of the entrants in the GGR are sleeping in the settee berths in the middle of the cabin. And if and when they get knocked down or rolled over, if in they're in one of those bunks and it goes, they're gonna get chucked out of their bunk. No questions asked. So I was strongly recommending to them that they all put webbing a strap, like a seatbelt for your bunk so you could slip in. If you're in a quarter berth, it's not a problem. That's what I had in the BOC. I was in a, had two quarter berths and the tunnels and stuff. You'd see that if you saw the, the video. So that's about the only thing that, um, that I personally discussed with all the entrants on emails and briefings. I said, get a, get a strap for your bunk because you will get knocked down you'll probably be in your bunk when it happens don't get thrown off the, across the cabin um, I think some of them may have taken a helmet or whatever it is we don't know but uh, um, there's a certain aspect to the safety regulations and the rules in the race where we say you've got to have this this stuff but we don't prescribe to them how they've got to use it because we figure they're sensible sailors they're all very experienced so as long as we know the gear is on the boat for normal safety gear like their safety harness and things like that it's up to them when they want to wear it and when they don't. And the reality there as well um, is that if you're over the side single-handed, you're probably dead, right? There's no question about that. Um, and I, 
I, all the way around the world, I probably wore a safety harness probably less than 20 percent of the time, um, because you get to know your boat, you move around. They're a bit of a pain, you know, to clip on all the time and drag around. And I'm quite certain, you know, that now even our guys, they're not clipped on all the time. It just, just doesn't work. Um, but when they know the risk is there, they'll clip on. So, uh, so anyway, a lot of that was left to them. Um, the uh, next one is. Um, Oh, um, Dave uh, was asking, is there any, have we got any concerns or are there concerns about the stern hung rudders on boats like the Rustler 36? And the short answer is no, none at all. Uh, all the boats are built really solidly. Doesn't matter whether it's strapped on the stern, uh, you know, if it's a transom stern or whether it's slightly inboard or whatever it is. The real issue is the strength of the rudder. And, and uh, I know all the, all the boats, they went through their rudders. The tiller on Philippe Pesch's boat, that's a different story again. It's nothing wrong with the rudder, it's just a tiller. And that was modified. So, uh, so yeah, rudders aren't a, a big issue or a concern for us at all. Um, one here, I had a question from uh, Eric Grisilli. Uh, is Francesco sailing under the same rules uh, of the GGR now that he's uh, going around as a uh, Corozo sailor? And uh, the short story there is not really. He's still doing exactly the same course, solo non-stop, unassisted, all that sort of stuff. But I believe that he's, just, he's still uh, you know, using a, a GPS now and he can use his satellite phone freely so there's no communication restrictions and so on. The rest of it's pretty much the same. You know, it, It's a very personal, uh, intense adventure for him. Solo non-stop, unassisted for anyone is a major and, and certainly he'll... Uh, uh, have some adventures along the way so and we'll try and let you know what's going on as you know he's now joined the the weekly phone chat with us so we'll get a bit of an update from him um, every now and then as well um, a question from Tim uh, Whitaker how does the uh, uh, tracker uh, work out the positions and so on well obviously it's a GPS um, based tracker so the GPS is in the unit on the back that's the YB3I and then it transmits that signal to the Iridium telephone network uh, which then goes down to the rece to the uh, receivers um, and to Yellowbrick themselves, Yellowbrick headquarters. We have nothing to do with then the interpolation of the positions. They all do that on their program and we link into the Yellowbrick program on our website. So they uh, basically have a software program then that does all the rankings and the distance to go and the course and speed. All, all of those things, the, the average course and the average speed over the four hour time limit for the uh, two positions is calculated using the GPS again. And a lot of people, uh, everyone knows about GPS, but, but not many people know how they work. And um, I, I don't know whether I'd risk uh, boring you on this one, but basically all a GPS is is a, is a Doppler measuring device and it measures distance. And the distance is from your GPS re um, receiver to a satellite and back again. It measures the distance from the satellite to the GPS unit that you have. And with that distance, if you can imagine if I had a piece of string that was that long and I knew the position in the sky, which is the end of the string, the satellite, and I had a flat table here and I said, okay, where am I now on this flat table? That string would be floppy. So if you pull it out tight on the table and keep that string tight and run it around in a circle um, around this stationary satellite, um, it, it creates a circle and you're somewhere on that circle. Right? You don't know exactly where you are. But then you imagine you get another satellite here and you measure the distance exactly from that satellite to you on the ground or on the table. You've got a tight length of string and you do the same thing again, keep that string tight, go around in the circle, you're now on that circle as well. But where those two circles into cross over, you could be there or there because that's the only positions that you are on both of those circles. So if you get a third GPS, uh, satellite measure the distance to you because there's lots of GPS satellites in the sky you create another circle on the table and you can be guaranteed that those three circles will interact because there was only two positions where there was two circles now when there's three circles going around that distance from the satellite to the table where they cross over that's exactly where you are that's a very simplistic explanation of what a GPS is and that's it's all based on measuring super accurately the distance from the satellite to wherever your GPS is um, so it's all done by uh, magic okay um, okay um, Right, one from Am uh, Amit uh, Shuoka, talking about why restrictions at 45 degrees south latitude uh, until 115 west longitude. Now, some most people sort of know what lat long is. The, um, 
a lot of people don't. They know how it works on a grid, but they don't know what the relevance is to a globe. I won't go into that. But the reality is that 45 degrees south is a line uh, in the Southern Ocean, um, and uh, all our guys will be above that. Okay, so they'll be sailing above that line. In fact, uh, I've got 45 in the question, but in the notice of race, I think it's 44 degrees south. And when Joshua and Suhaili went around the world in the gold, original Golden Globe, they stuck to about 40 degrees south latitude, all right? Um, and that was where the roaring 40s were. There was a lot of sailing ships that had gone down there in the past. It was north of what they called the known limit of icebergs, um, quite a bit north. And so they sailed down that 40th um, degree latitude line, okay, going from the, uh, you know, heading through the Southern Ocean. The further south you go, the reality is the weather gets truckloads worse. The, the, the pressure systems, the low pressures that come through there are more intense because you're closer to the middle and the seas get bigger and so on. So part of the reason of keeping them up north is to keep them out of the, most, the worst of the bad weather and also keep them in touch with rescue facilities uh, from Australia or South Africa, for instance. The further south they go, the further away they are. And uh, how do we control that? We know where the boats are. We can tell if they cross that line. The entrance themselves will just be using their sextant and celestial observations to work out their position. They may not get a fix for two, three days or four days or five days if it's continually cloudy. So they'll be working a lot on uh, what we call DR position, just guessing where they are based on course and speed. And so they don't want to go anywhere near that line because for every hour they go south of that line, they get a two hour penalty. So if they're 10 hours below the line, they will get a 20 hour penalty right, on their time until such time as they cross back over the line. We count them you know, when they're below the line, that's, that's their period there. We can see that on the track and we say, oh, he was below the line 10 hours, right, he's got a 20 hour time penalty. And that's how we govern it because we don't want them down there, you know, it's too risky. Why would they go down there? Well, if you use what's called a great circle track, that's the shortest distance between two points on a globe, and you just pull a bit of string around the globe, that's the shortest distance between the two points. Um, and if you then make a chart, like a Mercator projection flat chart, that actually isn't a straight line between Cape Town and Hobart. It actually goes way down below 60 degrees south and hooks up towards Hobart again, but on a sphere, that'll be a straight piece of string stretched across. So that's the shortest distance. So really by staying above the line, they have to go further, but it's safer and that's why we do it. Now, how's the penalty um, uh, achieved? Well, they don't get to serve that 20 hour time penalty and stop when they're in the doldrums of the uh, equator, say, going back up the Atlantic. What they have to do is they sail all the way around the world and when they get to 45 degrees north latitude, so here's La Sable de Lone up here now, and they're sailing back up to the finish line, they will cross through 45 degrees north latitude. They'll be getting higher and higher in latitudes as they're getting close to the finish. And anyone that's got a time penalty, you'll see they come up to 45 degrees north, and that's an imaginary line here. They then immediately have to turn around and recross 45 degrees north and go down below it and they have to stay below 45 degrees north for at least 20 hours. And when they cross back through 45 degrees north, they have to be within, I think it's 40 nautical miles of where they, they cross. So they can't sort of cross it down, keep racing under 45 and then pop up the other side. They have to come back up roughly where they were before. So that's the time penalty thing and that's how it works. Um, and we use it also for some other things which I'll explain later on. Um, so, uh, okay, 45 minutes. Oh, we've got a question from Rob Havel. Um, GGR trophy, is it finished yet? Um, the GGR trophy, the winner's trophy, will be a perpetual trophy. And uh, that is quite amazing. It's a, uh, it's a model of Suhaili, right, built from all timber from Suhaili. As you know, Sir Robin has done an amazing major refit on Suhaili. And uh, there was a lot of excess timber that was used left over in that refit. That's the same timber that was on the boat when it went around in 68. So the shipwrights, and I, oh, I should have got his name, sorry, I've forgotten his name, who has been working with Robin, and Robin did a big chunk of this shipwright him work himself, all the work, taking all the bolts out and all that stuff. He's there all the time in his overalls doing the work himself, but he has a, a shipwright helping him. He's building the model. So they've, they've done the beautiful Harland deck and so on, and uh, that'll be rigged. I think Barry uh, Pictel, our media manager, is going to be involved with building the rig, and yeah, I'm quite certain it's going to be very impressive. It's not finished yet, but it will be. And that becomes the perpetual trophy forever for the GGR. So... Uh, um, a little funny side story there. 
A uh, question from Marie Ralph about the types of stoves. Um, so uh, different types of stoves, some are using gas and they've got lightweight uh, you know, gas bottles, some of them. Uh, they take about three 20 pound bottles, which is about enough to get around. Some are using uh, metho stoves, alcohol stoves, uh, simple burners, you know, with alcohol fuel. A couple of them, like Susie's got a really heavy Taylor's kerosene stove with an oven because she likes to do baking. <laughs> you know, um, not a girl thing because some of the guys have got ovens as well. Um, it's just a domestic thing and it's you know, psychological comfort, things like that. The problem with kerosene is that you can actually run your diesel on kerosene. And as you all know, we only allow 40 gallons of diesel on the boats uh, or 160 litres. And people can use that to manage their speed in the doldrums or where it's calm. So we have to make sure that the, that someone doesn't say, oh, I need 50 gallons of cooking fuel um, because I'm really hungry. I'm going to bake a lot of bread. But then in reality, they might only use 20 gallons and put the other 30 in the tank and run the diesel. So we've got a process there where you can only take a certain amount of uh, kerosene for uh, cooking. And if you want kerosene cooking plus gas, right, you get no extra kerosene. You only get the 40 gallons because it can be either kerosene, you can take some kerosene out of your diesel uh, ration, you might say, and use that. Uh, one of the best ones is, and uh, these stoves are called jet boil. They're fantastic. They're a little uh, gas burner portable with a little disposable canister on the bottom. Uh, you can hang it from the, from the deck head so it's sort of gimbaled or you can get a fitting. It's super efficient because you can put a container on it and it's designed to use every bit of heat around the sleeve of the, the design. It takes about one minute to boil one litre of water. A lot of the entrants have got freeze-dried food and so on. So it's very efficient if you want to save weight on fuel and be fast cooking. You can put this in and use your jet boil. You see them in camping shops and all that sort of stuff. Uh, super efficient. So there's a bit of a mixture on that. Some of the entrants got heaters as well, but that's another story. Um, I've got one here. Uh, uh, okay, see. Oh, can you? Someone was saying, can you, the viewers, see the wind speed and direction from the boats? And the answer is no. You know, like on the on the Volvo and the Whitbread, and uh, sorry, the Volvo and the Vonda and stuff. That it's all telemetry and it's all electronic and all those things. They they've got live connections coming back to shore. Plus, they've got wind instruments, electronics. Our guys have no electronic wind in its instruments at all, except for an echo sounder. Uh, we allow that as a safety aid and they still have to have a log line, so they have a weight on a string with all little marks on it, throw it over the side. Um, but there's no wind instruments, um, so we can't, and we've got no satellite link, so it can't be done. Um, what they do use for wind, some of them go like that, so oh, the wind's coming that way. But a lot of them have the old-fashioned manual handheld um, uh, wind instruments. Tommy has a one with the, the cups on it that spin around, and it has a gauge, and he reads that. Uh, to work out the wind speed. Uh, some have got a little device with a hole in it and a, and a tube going up with a little styrene ball in there that sucks up on Venturi and the more wind, the more it goes up. And, and uh, you know, there's different types of mechanical handheld units to get their own wind. Um, okay, uh, Bribal Sinclair asks, is the GGR going as expected or are there more problems than predicted? This is an interesting one because the media asked me a lot at the start of, or before the start of the race, how many boats are going to finish? And I, uh, you know, it's a hard thing to predict, but I'd say, so look, you know, I mean, I'd be more than happy if half of them finish. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, but no one knows. No one's ever seen this sort of event with the basics and just wind vanes and all that sort of issue. So, so uh, I often said to my friends and Jane and uh, some of the media, I said, look, I would expect to lose a third of the fleet by, when I say lose, see retirements, uh, uh, lose a third of the fleet by Cape Town. That would be my projection. And uh, then I said, uh, so if we started with 18, that's six gone by Cape Town. And I said, we'll probably lose a few more in Hobart. Uh, but after that, I think those that leave Hobart and head towards uh, home again, I think will be okay. And that's pretty much what's happening. Uh, I think at the moment we've got 12 uh, left in the GGR class. We've got two in, in, uh, in the Chichester class. And we've got, uh, we started with 18, if you include Francesco, that was on the list. Uh, and we've got three that have retired, and Francesco's a Caruso sailor. So um, right now we're pretty much on track um, to a prediction. So... 
and then I say, okay, is there any any dramas or problems worse than expected? I have to say no. There's some surprises. I'm always surprised when you see halyards breaking in the first few weeks of the race. You sort of think, what? <laughs> There's a long way to go. Um, but I think that's just settling the boats down. One thing I'm certain of and is that concept where the, the, the whole thing of sailing down towards Cape Town and onwards, that's the settling period. Exactly the same as happened in 1968. All those that weren't prepared, had the wrong boats, weren't really up for it, uh, whatever, they all just disappeared. You know, They're all safe, they just decided not to carry on. And those that got around Cape Horn and kept going, they did pretty well. And so uh, it's, at, it's all, all on track. I'm not, not worried at the moment, but I'm certainly, uh, we're all gearing up for the Southern Ocean, the entrance are, and so are we, you know? We, uh, no one knows what's gonna happen down there. Uh, the rules of the GGR. Uh, Ricardo wanted to know, how can he see the rules of the Golden Globe race? Uh, you can download the rules if you want. There's 60, 60 odd pages of rules, and you can see everything. So on the opening page of the GGR website, just keep scrolling straight down to the bottom of that page, and you will see uh, a download notice of race, and you can get it there. Um, so you'll see everything that they have to work to. Uh, Margaret Keyes asked about what's the deal with this collision bulkhead up forward and how's that, how's that made and what's it do? Well, if you can imagine, here's the bow of the boat, the front of the boat, um, and it, the stem comes down to the water line. Here's the water level. We require a bulkhead at the front of the boat, which goes from the deck all the way down to just below the water line, okay, at the bow. So if you hit an iceberg or you hit a ship or the, or the four stay fittings rip out and leave a big hole there or whatever, any impact in there and any holes, uh, the water coming in will only fill that little part, little compartment at the front. And that's 15, it's got to be back from the stem, which is the very sharp bit at the front. 15% uh, of the LOA, that's the length overall, back from the stem, there's got to be a watertight bulkhead. And then we say it's got to be filled with foam or disposable water bottles or bottles with their, with their lids clapped on, so recycling the disposable bottles and put them all in the forward compartment. And that means even if you do split it, it shouldn't take any water. And that was kind of interesting because you may have remembered that Istvan says he's taking 50 litres of water in the forward in his collision bulkhead up forward because his bob stay fitting, that's the wire that goes to the end of his little bowsprit, is leaking. And I'm thinking, oh, that's meant to be full of foam and, and not hold much. And I think what's happened there is he's probably got it full of bottles. I'm not sure what he had. And there's a little bit of space between the bottles. So it's filling up that compartment, but the bottles are stopping it going tops up. And so uh, um, it's, you know, yeah, that's pretty simple. So that's how it works. And they do it various ways. It could be ply plywood, fiberglassed in to make it watertight, but it's all inspected in their safety inspection to make sure it's um, uh, all good. Um, got Jojo Pickering was asking about what drogues are they taking? Um, and is a Jordan's drogue around? There's different types of drogues. I'll take you right back to the basics, which is what I used in, in, uh, in the late 70s when I took off. I was from Adelaide, same as uh, Mark Sinclair, Captain Coconut, uh, same yacht club, same everything. I got a small radial tyre off a car about this big, painted it white, it creates a lot of drag, and you put a bit of rope on it and you chuck it over the side if you need it, and uh, it slows the stern, it slows the boat down and keeps the stern tracking if you're gonna broach down big waves. I never used it, I used it as an auxiliary fender over the side. That's why I painted it white in case it marked on the hull. Couldn't believe it. Coconut turns up, he's got two car tyres <laughs> and he's painted them white. You've probably seen them on the deck of his boat. That's his drogue. He'll tie a bit of rope around it and away you go. You can buy a drogue. There's all different sorts. They're like a, a very strong funnel, uh, like a big canvas bucket or something with a with a with ropes on it and that comes to the back of the boat uh, and you when you put that over side it creates drag and stops your broaching and all these sorts of things you can buy Jordan's droves a long webbing thing with lots of little pockets on it and well, they, well there's different brands different types and so on and personally I've got to say in all the sailing that I've ever done in the last 45 years I've never used a drogue all right never because I, I'm a great believer of keep the boat moving. I've, I'm probably lucky because I've never been in a situation where I've been concerned about the boat. But if you look back to Matessia on Joshua, he'd read the books of what they used to do and playing drag, drogues and all this sort of stuff. And if you ever read it, it's very interesting, the process he goes through. He was getting hammered on Joshua uh, when he was sailing from Tahiti around Cape Horn back to, back to France. And he said, there's something going wrong here. There's something not right. And he said, bugger it. So he cut the thing off and let it go. And all of a sudden he's back in control because then he's able to slide and slip down waves and he can steer because the boat keeps moving. 
I'm one of those sailors that believes the safest thing to do is to keep the boat moving. The challenge here is that you've got to steer it by hand or your wind vane's got to be able to cope and so on. So it's not an easy formula. It's not an easy sort of decision which way to go and which way to not. So most of the entrants are carrying drogues. If they're not carrying a drogue, they're carrying long warps ready to slow down. I must admit, I didn't ask Sean Luke what he's doing, uh, whether he's got a drogue on board. That'd be interesting because he's got a lot of experience down there. But yeah, I'm not a fan of drogues. I'd rather keep the boat going. But when I do the, BO, do the um, GGR in 22, I will carry warps. Um, just in case, <laughs> but I won't take a drogue. Uh, I think they're too hard to manage most of the time. Um, and, uh, and history shows that when you're running a drogue with a wind vane, you run a high probability of damaging the wind vane. Um, so, uh, so there's all sorts of challenges there. And I don't know who's doing what. We'll find out at the end of the race when it, when it, um, uh, what was working and how many people use them. Another, just one final question now. Uh, I've got a question here again, and we, we covered off on this last session last weekend about the whole thing with radios and weather reports and uh, the entrants using their HF radio back to base, talking to their managers and so on and getting accurate weather from Windy TY and how do we monitor it and all those sort of things. We can't, we don't monitor it. Um, could the, the shore team give them weather routing advice if they wanted to? They could, but it's against the rules. So uh, if they got found out, they'd be in deep trouble. And honestly, um, I don't think they would. No entrant's going to be receiving advice on, from anyone saying, oh, you need to go down here and you need to go there for two reasons. One is you don't really need to know that because if you get good weather, you can decide yourself. It's not rocket science. And secondly, it's not in the rules. The majority, in fact, I've got to say, all of the entrants, why would they want to cheat? You know, they're doing it themselves, it's personal, um, and so on. So uh, there's a lot of honour involved with the, uh, with the rules and the GGR. Um, and, I, you know, personally, that's, that's the way to see, and, and uh, what the heck, you know, this is the, this is the Golden Go Brass. So um, I think that's about it. I think I've covered off on all of those. If you, uh, once again, you'll see the question box come up. Um, if there's anyone French here that's listening, uh, Christophe is also going to be doing uh, questions and answers in French now. He's going to do it every Wednesday from the office, and he'll put a question box up as well, which will uh, actually uh, say, hey, Bonjour, monsieur, comment allez-vous, s'il vous plaît? I'm going to ask a bit, a bit more. Um, so uh, if you're French watching this, you can ask, uh, uh, put your questions into, into uh, Christophe in French. Um, thanks again for all the comments. It's always good to get feedback. Uh, if you want to do us a favour, tell your friends. Tell them, hey, this GGR is pretty cool. Uh, like GGR and uh, share places all over. The bigger we can make it, the better it'll be, and it might help us get a sponsor in 2022. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> thanks for that. Okay.